Hey everyone. Hey, so we're here to talk about Android Wear and the always on screen and your apps. So I'm Brett Leiter. I'm the design lead for Android Wear. And this is David Singleton, the engineering lead. And uh, yeah, let's. <laughs> All right. Um, so Android Wear has had an always on screen from our, our, our launch a year ago. It tells you the time in the active mode, and also has this low power ambient mode for showing you the time. It's also really great at showing you your most important notifications, such as Jeff, who you probably saw in the keynote yesterday. He's trying to get in touch with us for plans later tonight. So I can wake the watch back up. I can interact with this notification. But as app developers, you can also deliver powerful user experiences using these notifications, such as controlling, uh, controlling your, your home stereo or navigating the real world. So that's the always on screen as it exists today. But we're here today to talk about the always on app. And so before we get too deep into that, I want to set a little context around what it means for us as people writing things down and having an easy way to reference that. So let's take a big step back, actually, 5,000 years back. <laughs> so the Mesopotamians first started writing things down on clay tablets for ease of reference. And actually, that's what kind of kicked off civilization. So the ability to write something down and refer to it or show it to someone else it was a really powerful enabling technology, but it had some downsides. A clay tablet is heavy, it's brittle, you can only write on it once. So we're humanity, we work on things, we make them better. And so fast forward a couple thousand years, and you have papyrus. So papyrus is flexible, it's much more portable, you can write on it with ink, with multiple colors, but it still has some bugs. You can only write on it once, it's not accessible to all, it's not, it's not super flexible. Uh, so again, we work on things as, as humans, and we're going to fast forward through history a couple thousand more years uh, to the 20th century uh, and the invention of the cathode ray tube. So this, was, this is transformative. Having an electronic display that you can put anything on um, really changed things and allowed us to, to have lots of flexibility in what we put on our screens, what we put on our displays. But again, downsides. It's heavy, it's bulky, it consumes a lot of power, and in the beginning, they were very expensive. So we work on it some more, and we come up with the segmented LCD display. This addresses a lot of the issues that we've talked about to date in terms of power and bulk, right? L segmented LCD, LCD displays are uh, really light, really portable, uh, don't consume much power, but they have a, a really killer downside, which is when you're designing the hardware, you have to think about all the information you could ever want to put on the display and bake that into the hardware. So very inflexible. So that's what brings us to the present day with Android Wear and the always on screen, where you basically have all the things that you could want in a single device, portability, and, uh, and, I'll, and I'll get into that in a second, sorry. Uh, so let's, let's look at the timeline, right? We've had 5,000 years of display technology, and always on has actually been the vast majority of that time. So let's zoom in to the far right of the, of the timeline here, and you can see that occasionally on screens, electronic screens, have only been prevalent in the 20th century. You know, this, the screen that's your tablet or your phone that you take out of your pocket and you have to like go and grab it and turn it on, that's actually not been the case for a really long time. And so we're finally at the, at the beginning of the always on era. Uh, and so that regrettable period without always on displays is behind us. And so now we do have our wish list. We basically have color for flexibility and expressiveness. We have pixels to display whatever we want to display on the screen. We have touch interaction, so users can manipulate and act on whatever they're looking at. And we have low power, so the display can stay on all the time and all day. And so uh, to show us what we can do with that, we've got David to demo the Android TV remote. Thanks, Brett. So hopefully that's given you a flavor of why always on displays are important. Let's take a look at a real life example of an application that is using the always on feature that we've just introduced in Android Wear. So last year at I.O., we demoed the Android TV remote control app, which is what you can see up here. Um, and it's really great. Uh, I've enjoyed using it sitting at home, controlling my TV from my watch. Um, and it already makes great use of contextual notifications in the stream. So I can just wake it up, tap this card, and I'm going to go into the remote control app, look at my TV in the picture in picture. I can wake it up, can swipe down to YouTube, and I can start playing a video right there. So this is a great video that I made of my ski holiday. Um, now, previously with Android Wear, 
if I was watching this video for a long time, my watch would eventually time out, and you'd go back to the time. Um, but with Always On, there's a better way. And what you can see here, the latest version of the Android TV remote app, we've actually integrated the Always On uh, feature set. So we're back in the ambient low power state. And you can see that the TV remote is still running in the foreground. Um, and it's decided to put the time there in black and white mode so that I can still see what time it is. And then the great thing with a real remote control, of course, is it's right there. So I can just pick it up if I wanted to pause this video or move on to the next thing. And with the Always On feature in the, uh, the Android TV app that we've just introduced, I can now wake it and back in the remote control. And I can instantly pause this video, fast forward, and skip on to something else. So this is a really powerful feature for applications that know that the user is engaged in an ongoing activity. And then when I'm done watching video, all I have to do is tap on the screen again. I'm going to wake the watch, and I can just press the hardware key on the side, and I'm back at the watch face. Now I have a general purpose smartwatch again. So hopefully that's given you a flavor of what you can do with this feature using uh, Always On. So let's switch back to the slides. Now that you've seen some of the PAR, let's take a look at what you need to do to enable these features in your own applications. So we've tried to make this as simple as we possibly could. Um, and there are just a few simple changes you need to make to your app to enable Always On. The first thing you need to do is to take any activity in your application that you want to remain in the foreground when the watch goes into the ambient low PAR mode and have it extend from wearable activity. So this is a base class that provides all this functionality. And then in your onCreate method in that activity, you simply need to call one method, which is called setAmbientEnabled. And now your activity will remain in the foreground when the watch goes into its ambient low power mode. There are also three important callbacks that your activity is going to get uh, to let you know what's going on here so that you can take the appropriate action. Uh, the first two I'll share right now. The first one is called onEnterAmbient. So this is called every time that the watch is going from the, the high par interactive mode into that low par ambient mode. Um, and you can see here, this is a real code fragment from the Android TV remote app. And you can see what we're doing is we're uh, going to set the background color to black. Um, we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, and we're also going to update the rest of our UI to look different, turn on the time in that low par mode. The second one that you need to know about is called on exit ambient. So this is called when we move from the low power ambient mode back into the interactive mode. And there, you just reverse those changes that you made as you went into ambient mode. So that's it. That's all you need to do to have your app be enabled for always on. A couple of little housekeeping things you need to do as well as your code. In your Android manifest file, uh, you need to ask for permission to use wake locks. You need to do this in both the wearable and in the phone app if you're not already using wake locks, because the always on feature uses them internally. You also need to request and optionally require support from the wearable support library. This is the library that contains the definition of that wearable activity that I said that you would move to extending. And that's it. So with that, we have been working with a number of partners, so developers that we've given slightly early access to these APIs for a couple of reasons. One, to make sure we've designed and built APIs that work well in our general purpose, and also to see what they did as they brought always on support to their applications in order to distill some, bre some best practices, which we're going to share with you today. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. First of all, let's go shopping. So, I'm in town for I.O. this week, but I live in London. Um, I have lots of friends in San Francisco. And every time that I come into town, uh, there are folks that want all those British things that are really hard to get hold of here. So I have this common use case. I make a list of groceries to go buy. Um, I either make that on a piece of paper or I put it on my phone. Um, and then I take myself off to the local supermarket. Now, as I move around the supermarket, it's kind of cumbersome to keep getting my piece of paper out or to keep getting back into the right app on my phone. So with Android Wear and the Always On functionality, there's a better way. Um, and one of our partners, Bring, have added Always On support to their shopping list app. So let's take a look at how that works. Here I am at the watch face. I go ahead and tap on the watch face to bring up the application launcher and start Bring. 
I created that shopping list before I left home. I can see I've got three items to buy. I'll go ahead and tap into that, open the list. And now I'm in their shopping list activity. And this one is enabled for always on. So the first thing I need to get is Swiss chocolate. Great. So let's walk off to the Swiss chocolate. Now, this is going to take me a while. So before always on, my watch would probably have been back at the watch face by the time that I got to the Swiss chocolate. But now I can drop my wrist. It'll go into that low par ambient mode. And you can still see at a glance that you need to go get the chocolate. And also, they put the time on screen. So that's great. Let's walk off to the chocolate. I get there. I tap the screen to wake it up. And I can tap one more time to mark that I've got the Swiss chocolate. I can swipe, move to the next item. English breakfast tea, definitely hard to get great tea here in San Francisco, but pretty easy back home. I can walk there. Again, I drop my wrist. It goes into ambient mode. I can still see throughout that whole uh, interaction what it is that I need to get at a glance. I get there, I tap the screen, and market is done. So I've got one last thing to get, Marmite. I hate Marmite, but I do have friends that like it. Um, and it's much easier to get back home. So we'll walk there, we'll drop our wrist. We're in this low par mode. We can see it's still Marmite we need to get. Get there, mark it off the list. And then when I'm done with all my shopping, I can close the app, and I'm back at the watch face. And I have a completely general purpose smartwatch. So what's up next? I've got my shopping. I've packed my bags. I need to get off to San Francisco. So let's board a plane. Now, the way that I'm sure all of us are used to doing this, I show up at the airport. I get given a piece of paper, a very important piece of paper, which I need to not forget. But I'm going to need to pull it out several times as I move around the airport. I don't know about you, but I find this a source of like, amazing anxiety. I keep like, losing my boarding pass, tucking it inside my passport, putting it somewhere when I'm going through security. And of course, mobile boarding passes have made that a bit easier, because they're always in your phone. But how many times have you found yourself getting to the front of the line, and you're you know, busy looking at a web page, or checking your email, trying to do all those last things before you get on your flight? And it's kind of cumbersome to get back to the boarding pass. Well, with Android Wear and the Always On functionality, there's a better way. So let's take a look at one of the partners that have implemented this functionality. So I'll start on the watch face. I can launch the American Airlines app. And here, it goes directly into the ticket for uh, the flight that I'm about to take. And I can see all the details of the flight right there, including when it departs and the gate number that I need to go to. If I drop my wrist and start moving around the airport, the watch is going to go into low par ambient mode. But my ticket is still right there on screen. And if the gate changes, it'll update, and I can glance down at it. But probably what I'm going to do next is try to actually uh, board and, and, and go through the gate. So I need that. QR code. I can tap my watch face. I can do this amazing fling gesture. I get to uh, a QR code, and I can go ahead and scan it at the gate. If I get busy and drop my wrist in that time, it times out to this low par ambient mode still showing the QR code. So that's pretty powerful. And now Brett's going to take us through a couple more. Sure. So uh, the day of a big talk like this, I like to go for a run in the morning. Helps calm my nerves. So let's do that. Um, uh, a way that I might do that today is that I would go out and buy a fitness tracking watch. I would like charge it, keep it synced with my, my phone or laptop. Um, so that's kind of a hassle. Um, but I do want to keep track of my run. So let's see if there's another way I could do it. Well, if I do want to like, look at my pace and my distance as I'm running, I could like, carry my phone in my hand. Uh, but I get really sweaty when I run, which is probably a common thing. And also, people running with their their phones, at least I feel like I, I look like a big dork when I'm doing that. And whether or not I am a big dork, uh, I don't want to feel like one. Uh, so I don't think this is a great, great solution either. Uh, so with Android Wear, we think that there's a better way. I think we've lost the slides. Hold a moment. Folks. All right, so I can launch the Endomondo app just by tapping on the watch face, tap on Endomondo from the, from the app picker, and I'm in the Endomondo app. And all I have to do is hit this big button here, and I'm recording my run. Next slide. Awesome. 
So I'm now tracking my run. Um, the counter is going to start incrementing. Uh, as I start running, the distance will start incrementing as well. And what I, what I can, you know, so, you know, here's the time going up. And if I drop my wrist, or it times out, it's going to go into this low power am ambient mode and track my time and, and distance about once a minute. The screen will update about it once a minute. And so at the end of my run, you know, as, I, as I'm tracking it as I go, um, I can wake the watch back up. And at the end of the run, I've walked, you know, run for 30 minutes and three miles. Uh, and I can just save my run. So my watch was a dedicated run tracking device. And now it's back to being a general purpose smartwatch. So we're pretty excited about that. Uh, I am, at least. Uh, and then our next use case would be a day like today. So at the end of I.O., after walking, watching all these talks, talking with all of you guys, being up here on stage, I'm going to be really tired. And I'm going to want to go home. And I won't want to wanna have to think about it very much. So what's a way that we could do that today? What's the way I would do it? I would probably get out my phone. I would ask for navigation home. And I would walk around the streets of San Francisco with my phone out. Now, that has some downsides. I might like bump into people. I might walk out into traffic. Someone might try to take my phone away. Uh, so let, let's not do that. Let's, 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 ha let's do this a better way. So with Android Wear, I can just launch CityMapper. And CityMapper's got this great button that I love, get me home. Yes. And it's telling me, oh, we think the best way to get home is 25 minutes on BART. And I, that sounds great to me, so let's just hit go. And immediately, CityMapper just tells me everything I need to do. I need to walk to Powell Street BART. It's about nine minutes away. And here's a map, and here's the route. And like, it's just all there right for me. So I can start walking, and the watch will time out to ambient, yet the information that I need to know, the, the next actionable step stays on screen. And as I approach Powell Street BART and you know, glance down at my wrist, it'll actually update and light up and say, oh, you want to wait for this train. It's coming in three minutes. And again, after a few seconds, it'll time out to ambient. But CityMapper stays on top to help guide me through my journey. Um, I think uh, uh, someone who's used this app, uh, it just came out uh, yesterday, told me it feels like having a superpower walking through the city. You can just, just glance an unfamiliar city. You can glance down and know where you need to go. Um, it's, it's pretty special. So when I'm done, I can hit the Home button and be back to using you know, my watch for whatever I want to use it for. And if it's not already, uh, so yes, yeah, so thanks to, to Bring, American Airlines, Endomondo, CityMapper, Zillow, Golf Shop Pro, Runtastic and Runkeeper, KLM, uh, Delta, uh, and Google Maps and Google Keep. These are, these are all app developers that have tried to embrace the always on screen. And what they've been able to do is transform their apps into an actual wearable device. And this is one of the reasons why we're really excited about the always on screen. Android Wear has been really good at keeping the time and giving you your notifications and allowing you to take quick actions. That's, that's, that, people love it for that, but it can be so much more now with the always on screen and always on apps. So it can be this immersive navigation experience, a fitness tracker, a fitness coach. It can be a, a to-do list manager, help you get things done. It can guide you through your travel and help you control your home. Um, so what you do with it, we, we'd love to see. Because we feel like we're at this, this point in wearable evolution where in the past, prior to this date, if you had an idea for a wearable experience, you would have had to go out and hire hardware engineers, mechanical designers, industrial designers. You probably have to do some fundraising, maybe a crowdfunding campaign, or find investors, contract with an overseas manufacturer. That's a lot of time and energy and effort just to even see if your idea, a single purpose wearable idea, is going to have traction in the market. Now, with the always on screen Android Wear, you basically have access to the entire Android Wear supply chain. So all of our seven devices today and all of our devices to come can become your wearable experience for users. So we're, we're really excited to see what you guys do with that. Uh, and to help you, we're going to segue into uh, best practices on the design and engineering side. So we we've, we've built, and uh, this is actually in our documentation, the sample stopwatch app. And on the left here, you see the uh, uh, interactive high power mode, and on the right you see our uh, low power ambient mode. And we're going to talk about the design changes you want to make uh, between these two states. So it's pretty simple. Uh, the first is to, when you transition to ambient, you want to use it black and white. So the two reasons for this are that it saves power on the vast majority of devices, and it's a strong visual cue to the user that the device is now in this low power state. Pretty simple. Second, you want to display the relevant time units. So this, again, takes two flavors. So because you're in a long-lived session, 
the user might want to actually know what the time of day is. So we've included that in the ambient display of this app. Second is that since the display updates only about once a minute, if you're tracking time down to the second, that doesn't quite make sense. And so you want to stop keeping track of time down to the minute and just so down to the second and keep track of it just down to the minute. So you can see that here. We're, we're counting up minute by minute. Finally, uh, sorry, third, uh, you want to remove any buttons that are on the display in ambient mode because tapping on the watch face in ambient mode wakes up the display and then, you can, then the user can interact with the display. So remove buttons when you're in ambient mode. And finally, this only applies to a small number of apps, but if there's any information on the display that the user might not want to have persist in ambient mode, just take it out as you transition into ambient mode. So that's all you need to think about from the design side. And let's hear from David on de development stuff. Thanks, Brett. So one of the, the most important things to understand uh, from a development perspective is that as we go into low power ambient mode, we're actually doing something pretty profound in order to save battery. And that is that we actually, as much as we possibly can, turn off the CPU. It's pretty powerful. So while your, your application is still in the foreground, the CPU is not running at all. And most of these development best practices are about how you can preserve that state so that you're really making best use of, of the user's battery. So first thing to think about is, as we said, it's important to be efficient in ambient mode. It's also important to be efficient in interactive mode. Because now your application is in the foreground. It's essentially become the home screen of the watch. Um, and that means that any time the user performs the wrist gesture in order to get into uh, interactive mode, it's going to be your app right on top. And that's really powerful for you as a developer. Um, but it also means that you need to think about efficiency of that mode just as much as you do the, the ambient mode. So for instance, this is not the right time to uh, grab some data and transmit it across the Bluetooth link, because spinning up the Bluetooth radio uses a lot of power. This is probably also not the right screen in your application to, to show any you know, videos or, or animations that run for a long time, because that's going to keep uh, the CPU in high power mode. So be efficient, both in interactive and in ambient. The next best practice is to choose the right approach for updates. So when you're in interactive mode, we do turn off the CPU, but it is actually possible to keep fresh information on the screen. And that's really important so you can have a great user experience. But it is something that you're going to have to do to choose the right approach of when you're going to make those updates. And the first thing that you might need to do for your application is not to update at all. So we saw a great example with Bring. I was shopping. The next thing that I needed to go pick up was still the same until I got there and woke up my watch um, and could say that I got it. So in the case of an app like that, there's no need to update the display in the low power ambient mode at all. And that's great. You're going to uh, achieve really great battery savings. Um, and, and that's where I'd like to encourage you to go if you can. Some other applications, for instance, we looked at uh, the, the boarding pass for American Airlines. Uh, they might only need to update the screen if something changes. Uh, so for instance, the gate changes, the time to depart changes. And we'll talk about that as well. Uh, but then other apps might actually need more frequent updates. So let's take a look. So I mentioned the, the possible best practice might be to update never. But if you do need to update periodically, I mentioned that wearable activity gives you three callbacks, but I've only shown you two so far. There's another one, which is called on update ambient. So we need to go back a slide here. We think we've skipped over a slide. Here we go, on update ambient. Um, so this will be called approximately once a minute um, to enable your application to update the display. Um, and you can go ahead, invalidate your views, and have them redraw themselves. Uh, if you need to update more frequently, that's also possible. Probably the best way to update more frequently is on demand. So for instance, if you have incoming data from the application uh, that you have running on the phone, uh, using the, the data APIs, um, then those will actually cause the CPU to wake to handle the data. And that's a place where you can update your UI. But if you remember the Endomondo example, that was a kind of long running activity, but where we wanted to maybe tell the user how far they traveled or how many calories they burned uh, by updating periodically. So Android already has an, an, a great set of APIs uh, to enable you to wake up the device, the phone, tablet, or watch periodically with Alarm Manager. 
Um, and if you would like to do that, you can set whatever kind of frequency of callback um, to, to wake the device up and allow you to redraw the ambient display. It's really important here to read the documentation for Alarm Manager. There are a couple different ways you can set alarms, and you need to use the ones that end in underscore wake up, because those are the ones that will actually start the CPU if it's asleep. And then that means you could, for instance, wake up every 30 seconds, figure out how far the user has traveled, and draw that on the UI. A couple of things to know here. The first one is the 10-second rule. So I've been saying you could wake up periodically with this, uh, with this API. Make sure that you're not waking up more frequently than every 10 seconds. If you do, then you won't actually be achieving any power savings at all. Um, and therefore, you might want to think about, in my application, how am I going to display information such that if I update less frequently than every 10 seconds, it's still a great experience for the user. The second thing to know is that you need to be a little bit careful when you're using the Alarm Manager API. You're going to provide it a pending intent to say, when your alarm goes off, please start my activity again. And you just need to be a little bit careful to use the right flags with pending intent. Make sure that you're using the, the flags that will cause uh, the same instance of your activity to be updated. So there's a flag called update current, uh, rather than a whole new instance of your activity to be started in order to handle that callback. It's also a really easy way to do this if you put launch mode single instance in your Android manifest file. All the details of this are in the code lab and the documentation that I'm going to reference at the end. The final best practice is to test on your wrist and not on the dock. So I've mentioned that we put the CPU in this low power mode um, whenever we're in ambient as much as we possibly can. Um, if you put your watch onto the charging dock, which is often what you'll do when it's connected via USB for development, um, because there's outlet power, we won't put the CPU to sleep. So you may see slightly different behavior on your dock as to if you took the watch off every time you put a new instance of your app on the, on the device um, and then use it. So make sure you take it off and check that it's behaving as you would expect, because the CPU will actually go to sleep. It's also important to test on your wrist, because a lot of the, uh, a lot of the applications that you're going to develop that are going to have glanceable information on screen um, really need to have as simple a UI as possible. And we find that if you're just sitting at your desk and uh, looking you know, at, a, at your device in one spot, you may not actually see all of the things that you might need to change. So get your device on your wrist. Walk around your office if you need to. Even better is take your application into the context in which the user is going to be whenever they're controlling their TV or buying their shopping. And that'll help you make really great choices as you develop your always-on apps. So, now that Always On enables Android Wear watches to be many devices in one, as Brett explained, we're really excited to see what device you're going to build. So in order to do that, here's what you can do next. We have documentation at developer.android.com. The full URL is right there. We've also developed a code lab that will walk you step by step through the process of adding Always On functionality to a simple stopwatch application. That's the end of our talk. Thank you for listening. Um, please give us your feedback, and we have some time right now for some questions and answers. I think that there are a couple of mics out here in the audience. There's one here and one over here. So if you've got questions, step up to a microphone. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Great presentation. Thank you. Oops, live mic. Um, is there any facility for multitasking to have more than one screen, more than one application be available in the low power mode? So great question. The question is, oh, everyone could hear it on the mic, so multitasking. First of all, one thing that's important to remember is it is possible for your Android Wear apps to run in the background in general. So Android is very powerful APIs for this, and we run Android on the watches. So you can do multiple, multiple apps can, uh, can run in the background. However, it is the case that only one of those can be in the foreground at, at the same time. So the, the idea here is the user is involved in a long, session where they're doing something in the real world, and your app can continue to stay on top. However, all those APIs that we um, have had before today still exist. So one of the best ways to get the user's attention if something has happened uh, you know, related to your app or service is to post a notification. Um, and by default, notifications will still appear on top of, uh, of always on activities uh, in the heads up notification mode. So if you are running in the background and you want to give the user the opportunity to switch to your app,
which could also implement always on, then post a notification, and they'll be able to see that. So a, a concrete example of that might be that you're navigating and listening to music at the same time, and both of these apps you know, implement a, a full screen version of themselves. So let's say I, I was navigating, but I wanted to go switch my music. So I could hit you know, the hardware button to go back to the watch face. And as, you, as I did that, the app could actually publish a notification that was like, hey, you know, you're still navigating. Here's your next turn. And tap here to, launch, to relaunch me you know, into a full screen experience. So then the user can basically go down, you know, launch, launch their music experience, change their track, change their artist, go back to the watch face, and access that previous app via the notification. Right. So that's, that's the suggested w way that you would go and do that. And I think we have a, another question right here. Uh, congratulations for the presentation. And uh, I mean, my question is, uh, all Android Wear devices must have uh, off-screen mode. It's mandatory because Moto 360 does not support the, this feature, I think. The, the feature is supported on the Moto 360. You'll see in settings that there's an ambient screen uh, setting, which you can turn on and enable. Um, and obviously, always-on apps do require that the user has that setting for the always-on screen turned on. Um, on other, other devices, it's also possible to disable the always-on screen. So um, your app should still make use of the contextual notifications that we talked about if you want to have the user get in there during interactive mode. But, but I have to, in the Moto 360, all the pixels are, are on and uh, all colors, right? Yeah, good question. So um, I guess we, we can talk about screen technology here a little. Um, Brett mentioned that the best practice is to use black and white and actually keep as many pixels black as possible. And that's because a lot of devices out there have OLED screens. And for OLED screens, you only spend power for the pixels that are lit. But there are plenty of devices, and we're excited about the range of display technologies because they have different traits. For instance, uh, there are transflective LCDs, which look great when you're in bright sunlight because they reflect the light back. Um, and there are LC regular LCDs like the Moto 360 has. Um, so there, you should expect there to be a range of display technologies. We've distilled the best practices so that you can make good choices that work across all of those. So, it's true that for the OLED devices, the pixels that you light have the impact on, on par. For LCD devices of any kind, um, then how many pixels you light does not make so much difference. But we've distilled the best practices so that you can make good choices across all the devices in the ecosystem. Thank you. Hey, um, thanks for the presentation. What I wanted to ask you was, uh, do you have any plans for better haptics? on Android Wear devices, because right now one of the big issues is that sometimes notifications just get lost. I have the Zen watch and you know the vibrator, whatever is in there is good enough. And also to be able to sort of enable different forms of interaction where you're not, where you're not forced to look at the screen but still receive some information uh, just from a series of vibrations or something. Sure. So one of the things I'd encourage you to do is go and look at the, uh, the, the vibration API that exists already, because it's already possible to use different patterns um, of vibration in Android. That's a, an API we've had for some time. Um, and we're definitely excited about haptics in wearables, um, but we don't have anything to announce today. Thank you. Thanks. A few questions. Um, when I'm in uh, always on mod, is there um, a way to get feedback of how much CPU I'm using, like a profiling tool? Great question. Um, so there, there are tools that you can use uh, to see uh, how much uh, CPU you're using. Um, so you can take a look at the Android SysTrace tools, part of the, the default SDK. Um, and that will allow you to instrument uh, your app. You don't actually need to change your app, but to instrument the running session. And you'll get deep insight into how much CPU you're spending and exactly where you're spending it. So go look for SysTrace in the docs. I think we've got time for maybe one more question. Uh, so I have a question. Uh, when there's an ambient mode, uh, can I still have the force of CPU to run and the accelerometer and the gyroscope still running? Yeah, so the question is, can I still use sensors when I'm in, uh, in uh, ambient mode? And the answer is yes. So uh, this new always-on feature doesn't change the way Android Wear works uh, with the existing APIs. So it's already been possible. Uh, for instance, you can use those alarm manager APIs that we showed you to wake up and do some work with sensors. Um, but the best practices that we talked about still apply. So it's still important to think about how you can uh, use the battery sensitively. Um, and uh, you can definitely continue to do that.
Yeah, but I thought you said uh, the CPU goes to zero. That's true. So one of the things that we do, and we do this on phones and tablets as well, is if possible, we'll try to, to turn the CPU off. Um, but the way that you would already be using sensors uh, if you wanted to use them in the background is to uh, use the Alarm Manager API, which itself is going to wake the device um, in order to, to use the, the, the sensor APIs. And to be used very carefully, there are the wake lock APIs that allow you to hold the device awake while you grab that. And if you were already using sensors in the background, you'll already be familiar with those APIs. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. And if you have more questions, we'll be on this side of the room on the outside after this session uh, to chat more with you if you'd like. So thanks again for coming out today. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. <laughs>